Good morning. <clears throat> I was pretty happy to see you guys now have a QR code to scan in, you know, some feedback on the service. So I just want you to know I had a little time beforehand to give my feedback about the speaker this morning. <clears throat> Engaging, funny, sometimes a little long-winded. <laughs> And, but uh, commenting about the music was easy, awesome, amazing. So thanks, thanks, guys. Anyway, those of you who know me know that um, I've put my roots pretty firmly into indigenous thought. So we'll be wandering that way today. And I wanted to start with a, a native story. I also brought my, you know, my kind of scripture, which is Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which has more bookmarked uh, ears than anything else in my whole life. Um, so this is a story she tells in the book, and I'll expand on it a little bit. It's the native story of Nina Boso. Now, Nina Boso, in the Anishinaabe tradition, would be similar to how some of us might see Jesus or Buddha, kind of that combination of God and man, kind, all wrapped up in one person. So Nina Boso uh, traveled the earth as this wisdom carrier, checking in on all the original peoples as to how they were doing. That was his job. So at one point, Nina Boso came upon a village where the fishing nets were not being mended, where the people were not spreading out the corn, the sacred corn, to dry in the proper way, where the children are not being instructed in the right and good ways of the path. And Nina Boso said, what's going on? Where are the people? And he found the people lying on the ground underneath the maple trees, just soaking in all of that sweet syrup flowing out of the trees in a kind of stupor. Well, Nina Boso said, well, this can't happen. So he went down to the river, grabbed some big buckets of water, carried them, poured them right into the top of that maple tree to dilute all of that thick, sweet flow in the tree. Went back, got some more, poured some more in. So eventually, what the people were getting was diluted and not as sweet. And they started to wake up. And Nina Boso said to them, remember the things we are to be about doing. And they shook off their stupor and got about doing their tasks. So part of the moral of the story is now it takes 40 gallons of sweet syrup flowing from a tree to make one gallon of maple syrup. Um, but the other point is waking up from the stupor of whatever it is that is pacifying us. So today we are going to explore the word beloved, beloved. It actually has two meanings. It's as an adjective as an, and as a noun. So we're going to start with the adjective, where it describes these qualities of something. So to be beloved is to be adored, much loved, cherished, treasured, prized, highly regarded, admired, esteemed, worshipped, revered. That's what the word itself means in an adjective form. Now imagine, if you would, all of those adjectives applied to you. You, adored, much loved, cherished, prized, highly regarded, you, esteemed, worshipped, revered. Now, unfortunately, we can't go through this life expecting that to come from other people because it's going to start coming from here. When you think of the word beloved, you hold this mirror up in front of your face and you say to that image, I admire you. I revere you. I treasure you. 
Because if we're expecting it to come from all these other places, we're just going to end up being a little disappointed because we can never quite meet those standards. So we hold that mirror up and we begin the path of having a beloved relationship in this world with us. It always begins there. Any indigenous path, the first step is self-love and self-healing. That's why you go on a vision quest. That's why you have a teacher or mentor who takes you along so that you can find that deep sense of self-healing. Now, if you're like me, you might have grown up in a family or a world where that was considered a little selfish. All that time, you know, looking in a mirror, trying to get yourself together. Uh, so we're just going to let go of that, because that is just not true. This is the most important work I believe any of us can ever do, is getting our own little soul clear and loved and adored. So another uh, <clears throat> teacher that I've been reading is uh, Don Oscar Miro Quesada, who wrote Lessons in Courage, um, and he's a Peruvian shaman. And he says this about creating that kind of self-love. Once upon a time, we all had this sacred relationship of knowing our place in the balance of the universe and nature. We all carry a template that remembers. But with the rise of this modern world, we have become forgetful. We have fallen into this long and painful sleep of forgetfulness as we become isolated from one another, from our true selves. And in forgetting, we suffer these difficult experiences that we have in life can awaken us to remember. So you caught that about that long sleep of forgetfulness, like the people lying under the maple tree. Because we all have things that kind of numb us, right? Put us into forgetfulness or sleepiness. It happens in our culture whether it's social media that can distract us, um, or in my life, it's Candy Crush. I love that little game. <laughs> I, can't, can't, I can't help it. Uh, you, we all have things that numb us. We can use substances to numb us because we're in a time where our isolation is so painful that we tend to want to numb it. But we're being called to remember that there is another whole way of being to remember our wholeness. Uh, Don Oscar goes on to say, if we can remember our beauty, our wholeness, and that the purpose of our human embodiment is to grow a soul. <laughs> our purpose is to grow a soul. So, we don't even have to think about it as a shamanic understanding. We can also think about it in psychological terms. Maybe you know Carl Jung, a uh, famous psychologist who helped us come up with language we use a lot like ego, persona, archetypes, shadow. Those are all things that Carl Jung helped put into our vocabulary. And Carl Jung says that, um, this is his quote, that the self, capital S, the self is our life goal. The self is our life goal. It's our essential being, our highest version of ourself. Now again, that is not being selfish or self-centered. That's different. Cultivating our soul is all about uh, finding the self right there in the center. So when we're not centered, things happen. That's when we overreact, right? Somebody says something and we get a little bent out of shape, whether they intended to hurt us or not. Or we can get pu pulled off um, balance and we can start to feel victimized. Or we can get pulled off balance and get ag aggressive. Those things happen all the time. And when, when we're pulled off balance, our job 
according to Carl Jung and according to the shamans, is to come back to our self, our highest center. If we can live holy and holy in our hearts, then these things can happen. So how can we begin to see ourselves as beloved? How do we heal some of those things that are rumbling around in there? Could be things from your past, probably is. Uh, could be things that you worry about in the future, probably is. But you bring yourself fully to this moment. So uh, I live on a farm, and it's almost time for the baby lambs to be born. And <clears throat> my partner and I have worked out a lovely little routine. She gets up early in the morning to go check the sheep, but I stay up at night and check them before I go to bed, which means I'm going out there in the dark. And I take a lantern. I know there's flashlights. I know there's things you can put on your head to see. But I, I love a lantern. I love how it illuminates everything all around me, not just what's in front of me, right? So in the dark, in the night, in the cold, I get to go out to the barn with my lantern to see what's going on and check it all out. So as we start to journey into our souls, I, I want you to think about taking a lantern in, not just a little flashlight to shine on one irritating person, uh, but you know that big lantern to get the whole view of what's happening in that dark little spot in your soul. And then to be able to ask yourself, uh, what does it mean to be beloved right here in this center as I look around in the dark of my soul? So that's one thing we can do, take our lantern into dark places. But we also need to take time back. I don't know how you waste time, but we all do it. It's inevitable, as I already admitted. At, you know, what, what, how can we take time back so it's ours to create, to take the time it takes to heal? At points in life, it's easier than other times. I mean, being in your 60s, I don't know, it's a little easier for me because I have a little more time. But that should never be an excuse. There's always enough time, always, for us to tend to what needs to be tended to. And we need to evaluate what are those things that we're using to numb us or to distract us. Because we don't, we don't want Nina Bozo to be coming around and <clears throat> reprimanding us. So take back time. Another thing that's been very helpful to me comes from Mikkel Smith, who's one of my current teachers. And he talks about uh, the C words, like, you know, A, B, C, C words. So he has eight of them that help us explore where we might be off balance. But it begins with the center, the big C, big C, our center, which is our heart. Our, our culture, we tend to want to lead with our head. Let me just evaluate it. But you know, our spirit asks us to sink down into our heart to, to evaluate things from there. So we sink into our center. And then when we start to encounter things that pull us off balance in this world, the first things he said we need to reclaim is calm. That's the first C. Which way are you seeing it? C. <laughs> uh, this one, here we go. <laughs> here it is. <laughs> this, the first C is calm. Uh, are you calm in the face of what you're facing? How about clarity? Can you find clarity? If there isn't any, then that's what you got to go find. Confidence of how you're responding, how you are in that situation. And then a curiosity. Huh, I wonder why that's happening now. I wonder what that person means to me. I wonder, I wonder. And developing curiosity. Creativity. If it's lacking in your life, you're missing something from your big C. Connectivity. How connected are you in the real and good ways? Compassion. Not uh, rescuing, but true compassion. And the last one is courage. So when we find ourselves, you know, you know the places where you're off balance, right? Check in with those C words. 
calm, clarity, confidence, curiosity, creativity, connectivity, compassion, and courage. Chances are one of them is getting kind of pulled or hooked or off balance, and then you discover it again. It also shows you where things need to heal. So if you're trying to live out of the big C, the center, and you can't find clarity or calmness, then chances are there's something nudging at you to heal, poking at you a little bit. Come on, let's get to this. And believe me, this world needs us to heal. You know that. For us to be uh, good humans on this world, we've got to get to our things. So that's the first thing. You're shining your lantern. You're taking time back. You're thinking about where you get hooked with all of those C words. It might mean you need to get into therapy. I don't know. It might mean you need to find a shaman who can work with you or an alternative healer of some sort that can get your energy flowing differently so that that big C, your center, can heal. It's never too late to revisit it, ever, always. Uh, but you have to find what works for you. Chances are we can't do it alone because that connectivity word is part of it. Like if I think I can just heal myself, which I have to tell you, I do tend to think that a lot because I have a lot of courage, um, but I can't. I just can't. I can't do it on my own. It's not possible because in this human world, I need those interactions that just help me balance and heal. So that's the adjective of beloved. You're looking at yourself. You're thinking about all of who you are. You're looking at what needs to heal finally, at last, um, so that you can be your very best centered self. And then we move it into the noun, the noun of Beloved, so beloved, beloved, means someone or something that is much loved outside of ourself. So we're doing our inner work, and then we start to think about what is beloved outside of ourself. Now, you can think about it as a person if you want, like who is my beloved, uh, and then you start applying all of those C words to that relationship. How am I on clarity and compassion? Uh, and that's a great way to heal. But I'm going to come back to Robin Kimmerer again, who really encourages us to develop a beloved relationship with the earth, with all of creation around us, all of the elements. One of uh, the quotes from Robin that I really come back to again and again is she said, we've been tricked into believing that belongings will fill our hunger when it's belongings that we hunger for, belonging that we hunger for. We think belongings are going to fill us, right? So we, Amazon is right there. Uh, we can fill us. Uh, but really, what, what we want is a sense of belonging, not belongings. So that switch. And belonging to the Earth, to this very precious planet where reciprocity and gratitude shape and hold everything as beloved. You know, this is the perfect time of year to fall in love with the Earth again, right? I mean, fall in love again, just like, just like your first time. Just every bird song when you come out the door in the morning, oh my gosh, the robins were singing this morning. Every, every change on the trees and the, the way that they look as the buds come out, it's amazing. Every, I swear every crocus comes up and it's singing a song, every daffodil tucked in the snow this week. Uh, everything is inviting us to fall in love with the earth. I love hauling compost. We have a lot of it because we're a farm. So I, I get to wheelbarrow that compost from this big pile over to my gardens. And just the smell and the richness of the earth just makes me fall in love again. 
there are seeds that you're going to be working with or flowers you'll be imagining. All of it, all of it allows us to fall in love with the earth again. And every piece of something that we do for the earth, we're doing for our own big C center also. Because there's no way that that beautiful plant I'm growing doesn't also nurture me and I nurture it. That's reciprocity. That's a beloved relationship with something. Now, I really don't want you to think that I've always been good at this, because I have not always. This is something we learn. So uh, several years ago now, when I was starting to study the indigenous path, I knew I had to start planting stuff, that I had to work with the earth in this way. And <clears throat> I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin where we had huge gardens and huge work. That's all I remembered. Work, 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 work. That's what you did. You, you had to plant, you had to weed, you had to pick it, you had to process it. And so when I grew up, I'm like, I'm going to the farmer's market. <laughs> That's what I did. But I knew at some point I couldn't get away with it anymore because of where I was heading to my, find my big C here, my center. So. Uh, we started to till up some of our uh, yard uh, for gardening. And we live on clay, so it took a lot of amending of the soil of that compost I was telling you about, a lot of wheelbarrows. So we had the garden all planted, and my partner said, let's just do one more row of green beans. And I'm like, <laughs> I just wasn't happy about it. Because we'd already tilled and planted, and I thought we were done. and. I didn't think we needed any more green beans. But that meant one more row of tilling, one more row of, of you know, getting that compost moved. And I was so tired, so I'm taking those bean seeds. I'm just grumbling. We don't need more green beans. Why can't we just start with, it was going to be so many weeds. And I'm grumbling, 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 right? I'm so sorry I did that, but I did. So the beans all start coming up. And when beans come up, you know, they're a pretty sturdy little plant. They kind of pop up like this. They kind of bend over a little bit. And then they start sending really cool things. And I'm like, oh, you guys are so cool. You know, they're coming up. Uh, now I'm being nice to them. And, <laughs> and within a week, all of those beans were blighted. So, you know, we got out the books. And what, what happened? What, you know, what's going on? And... And I can tell you what went on. It wasn't some unnatural pest coming in. It was my grumbles. I planted them, and they heard me, and they're like, meh, meh. Now, you know, <laughs> it's the truth. It is the absolute truth that now, I sing when I plant every seed. We're just going down the row, uh, singing along, because that is reciprocity. That is my saying, I am co-partnering with the earth. I do this part, she does this part, and then we're grateful. This is what a beloved relationship with the planet begins to look like. Everything I do, I do out of my center as gift back for everything we've been given. <clears throat> so how will you venture into the places to risk being beloved and being one who enters a beloved relationship it means walking in harmony. It means walking in acceptance with all people and all things. It means being willing to have your little heart just cracked open a little more. No matter what age you are, no matter what you've experienced, let it open up a little more to that deep healing. To be cracked open, to love yourself, to love the earth. Oh, it'll let you take deeper breaths. It just will. So when you answer that question 
uh, how do we live in this world? How can we be beloved in this world? May you answer it through the story of your life, of your mirror, of your love for yourself and for this precious, precious planet that we get to share. May it be so.